The Mavericks, bit of a free fall with a league worst 14 and uh, 4 and 17 record. They love 14 wins, right? Um, I don't know. Maybe if you're 4 and 17, that puts a coach in that what the heck, screw it mindset. But regardless, here's what happened last night against the Kings Dallas had no timeouts left. Yet twice, Carlisle called a timeout anyway because he classic. wanted to stop play and talk to his team. Of course, if you it. call a timeout when you don't have one, you get a technical, guys. You get fined two thousand dollars each time. But hey, you do stop play. So I, I don't know, Tracy. Is this a next level genius move, or Man, is Carlisle no. kind of lost at this, this point? They this, still this, lost by thirty-one. It didn't do anything. That's why he was calling them damn timeout. Yeah, <laughs> like, he was trying to figure out something else. I've never seen that before. Listen, man. For a coach to call timeouts when you know you don't have any more timeouts, that lets you know how bad y'all playing right now. Right. And this is this is an embarrassment. If I'm a player on this team, we got to have a meeting. We got to come together and figure something out because our coach is calling two timeouts that we don't have. Yeah. And I always knew Rick. I always knew Rick had a dry personality. You and played for him. I played for him in Detroit, and a lot of times I think uh, with the organization, they always said, "Hey." Uh, he, he can't relate to the players. And what he did out there, i never seen anything about it. I, I wonder what was his message to his guys in that locker room because you really can't. There's no strategy to what he did. I played with Jeff Van Gundy. Right. I played for Jeff Van Gundy. And I'm, I'm used to him calling timeouts 20 seconds into the game if you mess up a right. play or mess up an assignment. But not when but you he never. Had them. Not two yeah, times. He had them. He gave it to us twice, though. Right. He called two timeouts. Right. And but he was, didn't have any. I know. What was that all about? Well, this was a couple nights ago, and, and he said afterward, he goes, let's be honest, you're never really out of timeouts because you can just do this that's and that get dry the technical. Humor. And, I told you that's that dry that. humor. I don't know. If he has $4,000 extra, dollars, though, we probably have some oh, suggestions of other ways he could spend it besides on all these technicals, but that's just me. All right, guys. <laughs> there is no one in the league, as both these guys know, quite like Greg Popovich. He went off after last night's game, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first, I just want to throw you a little context about Pop off the court. You remember, I'm sure, his strong comments after the election. What you might not know, though, is how Pop followed those words up. A few weeks ago, he and Harvard professor Cornell West volunteered to speak to more than 250 local San Antonio kids. These were kids who, for the most part, had a skin color that's very different than that of the president-elect, kids who'd talked to their parents and teachers about feeling scared by a lot of the recent events in this country they felt left behind. And here is what Pop told them, quote, hopefully you all believe in your soul that there are many people who care about you, love you, and know that you have tremendous value. Don't let anybody take that away from you. I wanted to show you there are people in your community who care, and we understand that there are problems that have to be fixed. He then went on to answer questions for more than two hours. And it wasn't just kids there that day. The Spurs players and coaches were also on hand on a Sunday, not because they had to be, but because they wanted to be. And that's where you want to circle back to what happened last night. The Spurs, they lost the Bulls after they came out flat. They fell behind by 18 points. And afterwards, Pop was asked what he as a coach can do to get his guys more ready. And, well, he was Pop. Listen to what he had to say here. I don't remember playing tonight. I didn't play. Uh, guys get a lot of money to be ready to play. No Newt Rockney speeches. It's your job. If you're a plumber and you don't do your job, you don't get any work. I don't think the plumber needs a pep talk. If the doctor botches operations, he's not a doctor anymore. If you're a basketball player, you come ready. It's called maturity. It's your job. Not subtle. Just like a couple weeks ago when the Spurs won a game against Dallas, won a game, and Pop also not subtle, calling his own team, quote, pathetic. Now, with some coaches, frankly, this act could get old. San Antonio may have had an off night against Chicago, but the Spurs do have the second best win percentage in the entire league. And on a lot of teams, if players were performing that well, but kept getting publicly ripped, well, that's the kind of thing that can lose a coach a locker room. But these are the same players who heard Pop talk to those kids a few weeks ago who have been hearing him for years. And the kind of man that Pop is, the integrity he regularly shows, that matters in this equation. That's why Pop has the room to be extra harsh, even when it's not always completely warranted. And that's why he remains this sport's best coach, period. Now, Tracy, you played for Pop. You can tell us what it's like firsthand his principles and credibility, does that soften the blow when he sometimes <clears throat> really, I mean, he calls guys out hard. Well, um, five-time champion. He's the best coach in our game today. 
he know what it takes to motivate his players. Um, with saying that, they're 18 and 5. Now, people from the outside will look at this and be like, what is he complaining about? They're Chill. 18 and 5. They have, but a coach of this caliber, any coach, a coach in the NBA team, you know the temperature of your team. You know that although we're 18 and 5, we're not playing our best basketball. And this could be devastating coming down the line. Yeah, that's the definition of his comments was the definition of a championship coach. Uh, I had the luxury of playing with a great coach in Larry Brown right. and Jeff Calhoun in, in college. And both coaches, they would they would say different things uh, in the locker room or before practice to try to motivate guys because they understood that in order for us to win a championship and get there again, we had to be prepared. We had to be hungry because a lot of times it's a long season and, and with them being 18 and 5, they kind of get complacent. So with not having Tim Duncan in that locker room, he got to figure out different ways to motivate these guys all year Look, round. When I was there for that short stint, very, very, very short stint, <laughs> I saw Pop coach Tim Duncan like he was one of the 15 players on the guys on the team. Like he got on these guys, Tony, Manu, he got on them. Uh, like, you know, they were rookies and they sat there and they took it. And you as a young player see Coach Popovich getting on Hall of Fame players like that and they sit back and take you have to fall in line. Are there times, though, where, where it does sort of get so abrasive? I mean, from my perspective, I spent years as a sideline reporter. I had a great relationship with Coach Popovich. We will have long conversations off the court, you know, about things. And he's been incredibly kind and respectful toward me. I got lucky with him in sideline interviews. We never had like an incident or a moment. Mm -hmm. But I know several people who have, including the great Doris Burke, who is fantastic at her job, or David Aldridge, who is a Hall of Fame reporter. And he doesn't have to be that harsh to them. This is just their job. And by the way, the league gets paid a lot of money for TNT and ESPN to be able to come and do that. And there are times where, Trace, I know you've told me about interactions you had with him. I mean, are there points where you're just sort of like, dude, chill out? Yeah, I mean, that's what, what are you going to do? That's his personality. I, I'm not going, we're not going to be able to change that. That's who he is, right? Um, I, I think sometimes it's frustrating uh, when you're trying to get things, get an answer out of him and he comes across that way. Um, it was like that with me sometimes. Yeah. But, you know, hey, what am I to do? I, I was always, I mean, well, I mean, for me, though, there was always a cushion of like, okay, but he's such a good guy. He's yeah. such a good person. He's so smart. And he does have that championship pedigree. It makes it all, it makes it all go down with a little bit more sugar. I don't know. Uh, let's move on to Carmelo Anthony. He'd been pretty quiet about Phil Jackson's comments that basically accused him of being a ball hog. But he did post a couple cryptic Instagram pictures yesterday. The first post reads, ego is the only requirement to destroy any relationship. So be a bigger person, skip the E, and let it go. And then a photo of Muhammad Ali with unfazed. My life summed up in one photo. Stay mellow. Now, a, a little cryptic, maybe. Not that cryptic. We all maybe knew who he was talking about. But he made it clear today. He said, I didn't talk to Phil Jackson, so I don't know where he was coming from with those comments. If he wants to talk to me about it, cool. If he doesn't, cool. In my eyes, it's over. I feel like we're playing good basketball and just seem to have a temporary black cloud mm. over our heads. Mm. You gotta love it. Mm. I, I, I love hey. it. I like, I like, hey. that, he, I like hey. that he stepped up because, and that's when you really gotta love social media because be it gives the players a voice. Right. And a lot of times when you talk to beat writers and, and writers and things like that, sometimes they they take your message and they 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 trick they, they, they turn, they, they turn your words around. Even if even if everyone has good intentions, <clears throat> right. is good at their job, you are going through a filter. They this do way that. You can go direct. And a lot of the teams, they pretty much run a lot of these mm -hmm. B riders. So with social media, it gives a guy like Melo a voice and and lets the public know that hey, you know what? He's not cool with just what Phil Phil just actually out I like there the just fact that just he, saying words. Did he call Phil out? Yes. I mean, I really do. Um, I, I like that he is. Going back at Phil because he's caused some unwanted distractions to the team. Yes, they've been playing. They, they have been playing good basketball as of late for the Knicks. They have been playing good <laughs> basketball as of late. I did throw that saying. in there. Yeah, and for all this to to be circling around this organization based off of what Phil has been saying in the media, I mean, you're causing just unwanted distraction, throwing your best player under the bus and, and putting him out like that. I mean, that that's not cool. I'm glad Melo came back at him like yeah. this. I I don't think Melo was so happy with Phil's comments about his friend LeBron Absolutely. either. And he kept have been. his tongue held then, and then this happened. 
And I think Melo's earned it, frankly. If he wants to come out and say, look, this isn't cool, he has earned the right to do that. And look, and, and Phil, too. I mean, uh, when Phil made his comments and then Melo said what he had to say, that it wasn't right, or what, what he said mm-hmm. about LeBron, I think Phil felt some type of way about that, too. Yeah. Really? Okay. So you think this was a little bit yes. more of a nudge in the other direction, power play, power 100%. struggle? Should not be happening within your own team. Just a thought. And as he's sitting next to... Oh, that's the man. Is that Mark Zuckerberg? I believe so. I don't know. I don't know. Like, like, yeah. I, I, think I so. thought it was Jesse Eisenberg, actually, who played, who played Mark in Facebook. He, he only wishes he was the man, I know, right? And had that bank account. Hey, he got a pretty he got a pretty good bank account, though, yeah, too, Matt. Yeah, actually knows who that guy is. Who is oh, that guy? Absolutely. That's my buddy Matt Prisker right there. His family owned uh, Hyatt Hotels. Oh, so he's hey. so he's in the the billion billion dollar conversation. Okay, yes. Okay. I mean, look, if you're sitting courtside next to Scotty, things have gone well for you. Very likable guy in to, Chicago to that too. Credit though, he he kind of favored Mark a little he, bit. Little he did, bit? yeah, a little, little bit. bit. He did. But he's he in that Mark. billion dollar Mark, boys club too. You can say anything too. you want. <laughs> Tracy McGrady, Rip Hamilton yes. in the house, and Rip and I go way back. We were actually in D.C. together. He was a rookie with the Wizards. I was a rookie reporter for the Washington Post, and that was also, of course, the time. Michael Jordan was with the Wizards. And it's Mm. funny, I always thought of you in terms of this. I think you're a kid, you're coming out of college, you realize you're gonna get to play with Michael Jordan and you think it's gonna be amazing, right? I mean, Michael's gonna take you under his wing, he's gonna share everything he knows, you're gonna go on long walks together, right? Whatever it is. (laughs) Except Washington MJ people, not a very happy MJ. He was like ornery old man MJ. And and I remember a lot. I know cursing, you do. You were there. Much. Like, You've like, seen it. There was like cursing, and then there was more cursing, and then there, there was like a little more cursing from Michael. And he was not as generous to the younger players in those moments as one might have thought, right? Well, like I tell people, Michael was fun. He had a unique personality. <laughs> Great to be Great around. Great to be around. Like when I was on a basketball court at times with him, he would show me the whole medium range game. Like he would dribble two times, pull up in the middle of the, in the middle of the court, and says, "Hey, Rip, get that in your game. That's the hardest play." in the game of to basketball stop. to guard. Yes, sir. But then there was also another side where it was the talk <laughs> and trash Michael Jordan. And at times, me and a couple of the young guys would come up to him and say, hey, Mike, why don't you think about putting us in the brand Jordan collection? Right. And he'd look at me and say, hey, Rip, my, sneaker for, my sneakers for all stars. <laughs> and at that time, I'm like, wow, nice. like, like, really? And then my other young fella, I don't want to say his name, and he would say, hey, Mike, what about me? Put, you, put, put me in your sneaker. And then he'll say, your game is not to the liking for my sneakers. Not good enough for the Not sneakers. good enough for Your my sneakers. Your game don't fit my sneakers. So, I mean, but that was the whole big talking trash with Mike. So, you just had to have thick skin with him. And I told him, did hey, you, you know home what? That day? How did you feel when you went home that day? You know what? I went home, I looked myself in the mirror, and I said, Rip, we're going to be all right. Right. Because I'm going hey. to come back to MJ. And I did. After I made the All-Star team, Are I came serious? back to him and I said, hey, M, now I'm an All-Star. Now you got to put me Look, in that sneaker. Man. Now you got to pay me the big bucks. And I'm, just, I'm just glad that the guy, he said, his game don't fit my sneakers. <laughs> oh, my the goodness. Question mark right? Oh, man. <laughs> right? Hey, he, uh, hopefully he had tough, tough skin, too, but he didn't. He didn't play too well, long. Well, people don't understand. Game. Even Mike at 38, 39, on that, he was still a bad boy. He was still boy. a bad boy. He got right? 50 that year. Um, he, he had like 40, like eight times. Yeah, I played against him. And I didn't have no sympathy for Mike, you know, at that because <laughs> he was still good. I tried to go at Mike and, and hit, you know, 40 or 50 every time I faced him because that's Michael Jordan. He's a competitor. Now, he wasn't Chicago's Mike, but... He was still damn pretty good. As you see, he fouled me right there, and I still made that shot. <laughs> they wasn't going to give you the call. They weren't going to give you the call. They so wasn't going to follow good. through anyway. Not at all. And again, we're going to leave out the cursing because this is a family show. Yeah. But it was weird that last year because he knew he was going to go back to the front office. So he was a teammate of yours, yes. right? Yes, he but was. But he knew he was going to go back upstairs, and he would say to you. It was weird because, you know. <laughs> You look up to Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's the greatest player of all time, and he was my idol growing up. So get an opportunity to play with him, knowing that next year he was going to go upstairs and he's going to be the guy actually (laughs) signing the check. You think, yeah, you're going to get in good with the boss. You got to get on. So I told the guys, I said, be careful now. Be careful of what you say to MJ. Don't talk trash to him. Let him win every conversation. (laughs) Because he's going to be the man that writes our checks. Absolutely. So we got to stay in our lane. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes he was nice about that. 
One hundred percent. Sometimes less so, but that's okay. <laughs> I want to move on to another coach who was quite vocal last night. We've already brought up two of them. Alvin Gentry will now be our third. He was plenty frustrated after the Pelicans lost to the Sixers last night. Philly snapped a 23-game road losing streak. You don't want to be the team they do that against. Mm. And afterward, Gentry snapped at a reporter who asked him about his job security. Take a listen. I really don't give a about my job status. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to work hard and I'm going to coach until the day they tell me I'm not the coach here anymore. It doesn't matter. I don't ever worry about that. That is not anything that I spend five seconds worrying about. My, my worry is that how do I get the guys in the locker room to play at the level that I want them to? That's where all my effort goes. It doesn't go anywhere else. Listen, man, it, 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 it doesn't matter who comes in and coaches this team. That's a depleted roster. You got a lot of these guys shouldn't even be in the NBA. I mean, you, you know how you go to some live shows and they like to put in fill-ins? You know, yeah. fill-ins. That, that's what these guys are on this roster. They just fill in the roster. That's all they are. That's, yeah. that's yeah. losing. Up. And that's losing basketball. Anytime you start talking about your job. Right. Hey, he, sometimes I think he, he was going into a job and think he had the same personnel from the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> because, right. Absolutely. Because he had shooters, especially there and also in, when he was the coach at the Phoenix Suns. Now you go to a team, you're 29th in the lead in three-point percentage. He doesn't have the personnel. You, you and I agree on this, and we don't think he's been set up to succeed. We've talked about it a mm-hmm. lot, and, and Alvin's great. I mean, he's a great guy, and, and he connects with players. Is there something, though, if you have the top 10 player in the league, you have to do something a 100%. little bit more than what no, they've been doing? Upstate. I mean, they're 7 I agree. 16. Mac is probably on this management. Team. It's all management. You, think you got to get him better players. That's it. I, I believe if you're the top five player in the league, it's, you have to be at least an eighth seed in the playoffs. If you have a top five player in the Western Conference. This I year. believe that, yes. Not happening. All right, it's a spe- time for a very special adist- edition of Distant Replay from this date in 2004. Tracy, do you know what we're talking about? Well, <laughs> my Chinese fans let me know. <laughs> hey, <laughs> they let me know. It's the 12th year anniversary. 13 points in 35 seconds. The young Mac right there. That was so good. Look at that light. And everybody on the court knew. Mighty. That's amazing. No. Mac, my you, Chinese name is Mighty. So. No, Mac, do you understand how good you were? I'm Sometimes when I talk to you, you don't believe how no, good you were. Yesterday, are. right? And whenever I introduce him, I say, oh, this man's going into the Hall of Fame. Yes. He's all blushy. Yeah. Look at your numbers. They are insane. Because it's funny. When I see guys like KD, Kevin Durant, and people are like, oh, these guys are the greatest wing players that ever played this game. I said, do you remember Tracy McGrady? <laughs> <laughs> do you know the guy that can right. play? 35 seconds. I, I mean, come on, man. Really, dude. Pat commercial yourself th- on the back every now and you then. For me. Oh, okay, baby. You go, this bro. commercial break is going to be longer than that. We'll see how much he scores over on the hoops. We'll let you know when we get back. <laughs> <laughs>